The Doug Wright Show, where Utah news breaks on KSL News Radio, 102.7 FM and 1160 AM. Thank you for joining us on today's Doug Wright Show, and uh, it is a real pr- uh, pleasure to welcome to our studios Misty K. Smith and yeah, Snow. Uh, Snow, I'm sorry, how did I get that? That just came out of the blue. Misty, thank you so much for joining us here at KSL. When we chatted yesterday, I mentioned to you yesterday, I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I really thought that there might be a victory in place, but I have to tell you that I'm surprised at the margin. I'm surprised at the margin on this. Were you? Uh, no, we, like I said, both, uh, there's a poll from Utah Policies uh, this month and also last month, both had me up 13 points among uh, likely Democratic uh, primary voters. So we oh, we were expecting a double digit margin, you know, so it, you know, so getting it, you know, it's like a good confirmation of the polls were uh, pretty much right. When did you last night watching everything? When did you finally realize, you know, we do have this thing in the bag? I mean, I guess we like said we we felt pretty confident, you know, for a while now because the polling, all the polls, it showed me that I was leading on my opponent up pretty significantly. But last night, what was that moment where you said, not only did the polls, not well, first, only were they first right, first results but we're now, sure. so you're up. I said, you know, stuff like that. I think the first county start reporting is like Salt Lake County. It was like sixty thirty nine. So we're like, yep, we're gonna do it. Yeah, because most I think most of the votes in the Democratic Party actually were uh, cast out of Salt Lake County. So I haven't heard if you actually had the chance last night to uh, receive a concession speech or chat I, with. He hasn't. Call, he hasn't contacted Mark campaign. Far as I know, is, is, is that surprising to you? No, not really. How come? I just, you know, I just think don't think he's ready to concede, but you know, maybe he'll call. Well, but we, like I said, don't know. I can't, I can't speak for his motivation. Sorry. Last night, when uh, I'm sure calls were pouring in of congratulations, we'll talk about the historic nature of this before too long. But what were folks saying to you when they called in for congratulations last well, night? Said, lots of people are so say they're so proud of me. How great it was. How happy they were. You know, just like the stuff you'd expect. I think, you know, any time while uh, somebody makes a major achievement. What, what do you think ultimately made the difference? Because often you'll have people in the same uh, party, and there are a lot of similarities. I noticed that in conversations with you at our editorial board and so on, conversations that mm-hmm. we had with uh, Jonathan Swinton as well, that there were some real differences here. What do you think made the difference for the voters, for Democratic voters in the state. The positions I stand on issues uh, appeal to more people. I mean, that's obvious. They like that I'm a working class person. They like that I want to stand up for a working class and st- fight for a living wage, fight for paid maternity leave, fight for health care, fight for clean energy. You know, those uh, resonate to uh, Democrats in Utah. As far as some of the some of the conversations that we, we had with both you and Mr. Swinton, that there were, as I mentioned, such dramatic differences, and mm-hmm. some. Uh, he is a much more moderate Democrat. Uh, he was even described by some as being a conservative. Um, he described himself Democrat. that way, right? And then you uh, took very, very different stands, and would mm-hmm. be considered to be a little bit more on the the much well, I, I think much more liberal side mm-hmm. of the Democratic Party. So yeah, the, the philosophy in the past used to be for Democrats, and I mean I've talked with leaders of the party, everybody else, major candidates, and they said, what we look for in this state is probably the most moderate that we can find so they can win the statewide election. It looks like there's a change of philosophy among Democrats right now to maybe go with someone who not only is more liberal, but also somebody, I, th- I think your race has really made a statement. Yeah, well said. You know, we saw like the March caucuses. You know, Democrats. You know, they turned out big for Bernie Sanders. And you know, my on issue after issue, I'm very similar to Bernie Sanders. And I think honestly, that might be really why I won the primary. But um, also though, I mean, in the presidential polling, Bernie Sanders has always polled very well in Utah, um, against the uh, presumptive Republican nominees. So I think you know, I think there's a uh, I think there's a lot of changing demographics in Utah. Utah being a very young state, millennials come of age. So I think that also uh, matters. And I think you know. Uh, talking about those uh, issues really appeals to uh, you know Utah Democrats, especially among uh, younger Democrats and among younger Utahns yeah. in general. I'm going to ask something just kind of straight up, and you know everybody uh, wants to win, and everybody at mm-hmm. some core level has to believe that they will win. But do you think that there is any level of conversation that might be going on out there among some Democrats saying, you know, maybe in this statewide race, maybe in a Senate race, it's going to be tough to win? I won't say impossible, but it's going to be tough to win, and you'd, you'd even say that. But 
Do you think now that perhaps for some Democrats it's becoming more important to show true stripes Mm -hmm. and to make the statement and to even make history, as you have, versus actually maybe have... I'm, I'm trying to word this carefully because I mean this to be very positive. But rather than win the whole enchilada, make the statement and be who you really are. Well said. You know, um, you know, it's all going against an incumbent in any race anywhere in the country is always an uphill battle. Um, but you know, like but previous Senate uh, candidates, they've nominated you know these kind of really conservative ones, and they got like thirty percent of the vote in the Senate race, like Scott Hall in his 2012 race. Like thirty percent, uh, Sam Granado's two thousand twelve. He had thirty two percent. You know, and they're both uh, fairly moderate Democrats, and it mm-hmm. certainly didn't win them the statewide race. So, you know, if they aren't going to win, you know, maybe it's better to nominate someone who, you know, like I said, if like I said, but you know, that's gonna speak to Democratic issues. Um, that gets Democratic voters out. Um, when you talk about like down the ballot, you know, in the two thousand fourteen election, I we lost a number of races by close margins. I remember hearing something like we lost like a five seats by like a combined yeah. Combined vote total is something like 295 or something. So, you know, having a Democrat who turns out more Democrats, who's exciting among Democrats, you know, can make a vote, can make the difference there. Um, But also, like in a poll that came out last week, I was polling at 37% in June, which is better than like the Democrats have done in their last four or five Senate races. So, you know, so I think there is an opportunity if you nominate someone that Democrats want to turn out for. As far as the the Bernie Sanders factor, because I've had a lot of people who say, you know, she has been so smart on this. She's played the Bernie Sanders ground game. She's had developed among the the younger voters, Mm -hmm. millennial voters, independent voters, you know, Democratic voters. She's been able to really kind of almost play that Bernie Sanders grand ground game is the best way of putting it. And when how do you think that's going to translate? I've wondered about that for Democrat national election. Mm -hmm. Are, are are the Bernie Sanders, and I'm asking this a little bit uh, expansive outside of your immediate race, are Bernie Sanders-type supporters going to be able to get on board with, with Hillary Clinton? Um, you know, but they said, you know, whether or not they can get on board with uh, Hillary Clinton, I mean, it remains to be seen. But, you know, by nominating candidates like, you know, for a statewide race, though, that, you know, that appeals to them, though, it's I think that'll help get them to the polls and, you know, which will probably inevitably help Hillary Clinton because I think— a lot of them, you know, they would rather have uh, Clinton than Trump, even though they might not be too enthusiastic about it. But, you know, getting them to the polls mm-hmm. uh, matters, you know, as a Democrat, because it helps me. But also, again, helps those down ballot candidates, you know, when we're trying to win, pick up seats in the state legislature. And, you know, and I think, you know, I think we have an opportunity to pick up, you know, maybe 15 and 20 seats in the state legislature this year, because yeah. I have a feeling it's going to be a really good year for Democrats in Utah. Boy, Bernie Sanders mentioned that. How many local legislator, uh, legislative seats have been lost throughout the country? Mm-hmm. How many governor's races have been lost by Democrats uh, throughout the country? And I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch that. You know, the elephant, or maybe we ought to say the donkey in the room that we haven't talked about here, is the historic nature. And some were reporting this morning that you were the first ever transgender candidate for a major political party to run for the United States Congress. It is technically true if we say Senate, because there is also, and the ironies of this, we have Misty Plowright. Mm -hmm. Uh, Isn't ironic I got her name right and I messed up yours. But we have Misty Plowright, who is in the 5th District over in Colorado. And so right now, talk about the historic thing. In the Senate and in the House, we have a transgender candidate for a major political party. First time ever. Yeah, sad. I mean, I think it's just, you know, I think we're seeing a change in... uh, you know, throughout the country where uh, LGBT people are becoming accepted, they are, and you know, people aren't, aren't afraid to vote for them, aren't afraid to support them. And I think that sh- is also helpful to the LGBT community because people all over the country see these uh, races, they see the news on it, and they're like, you know, hey, you know, being a person, member of the LGBT community is not a barrier to, you know, uh, pursuing a career in politics or pursuing a career in any other field they might uh, be interested in. You know, one thing, it, it's been interesting, uh, first of all, and I'm not sure if you and I have talked about this or not, but the, the reputation Utah has in general, but specifically the Wasatch Front and specifically Salt Lake City, for being uh, friendly to, open to, and welcoming to uh, the LGBT community is is kind of off the charts. And you look at some of the news that has come out of Utah. They're very well, had it not been for just a little uh, moving of chess pieces, the landmark decision out of the Supreme Court could have been Kitchen v. Herbert 
Utah. And you look at this Utah news Mm -hmm. surrounding the LGBT community, and you look now that we are offering up the first Senate candidate from the transgender community and from a major political party. Who would have thunk years ago it would be Utah? Yeah, I said, I mean, you know, I, you know, I said maybe 10 or 20 years ago it would have been surprising, but, you know, after, you know, Salt Lake City became the first state capital to elect a lesbian woman to be its mayor, um, you know, I think it's, it became less shocking because, you know, Salt Lake County is a, a very, very good place uh, for the LGBT community, so. Here's the question. What's the strategy now for Mike Lee? You know, we're just going to try to appeal to working class people and, you know, uh, middle class people and, you know, try to talk, you know, hey, I want to f- fight for, you know, working class people. I want to fight for a living wage. I want to fight for paid maternity leave because, you know, these are the issues uh, people uh, who have families that care about, you know, because we want to support working people and their families. And I think I can appeal to a lot of people that way. And that's the message we want to send out. We are going to be looking for opportunities to chat, not only individually as we move toward the general election on November 8th, but we'll be looking for opportunities for debates and Mm -hmm. uh, other things that uh, we'll want to accomplish during the election. We've certainly appreciated your cooperation. We appreciated you appearing before the uh, KSL and uh, Deseret News Combined Editorial Mm -hmm. Board. I've appreciated your willingness to join us here on the show, and I look forward to uh, more conversations. All right, just between you and me, how many phone calls are you getting from people around the country? I, I, I Googled it this morning, right? And I'm seeing Honolulu. I'm seeing all over the mm-hmm. country. Have you had re- you people reaching out, press reaching out from even outside the country? Um, I don't think about outside the country yet, but I've definitely had some national uh, news people. Um, like I said, the Associated Press was at our party last night, and then I called, talked to uh, ABC, like in New York, uh, to this morning. So I did an interview on the phone with them. So, Misty, I appreciate you joining us. And it's Misty K. Snow joining us on the program today. We look forward to many more conversations. Well, thank you, Doug, for having us. Uh, we appreciate it. And congratulations on your win yesterday. It is 1118 at KSL. Let's go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we've got much more in store for you.